Imagine the year 2000. The Matrix just dropped on DVD. The internet is still a sluggish dial-up connection for most of us. And console gamers? Well, they're used to living in a solitary world. No internet, no multiplayer dungeons, just you and whatever NPCs the game throws at you. That is, until Fancy Star Online came along. This is the story of how one game rewrote the rulebook for RPGs, gave console players a taste of what it was like to game together, and why even today, its influence is everywhere. In December of 2000, Sega and Sonic Team brought us something special, Fancy Star Online. But this wasn't just another typical RPG. This was an experiment. No, an ambitious experiment. Sega didn't just want to make an RPG. They wanted to make a statement. Online gaming? That's for PC gamers, right? Well, Sega's chairman, Asao Okawa, had other plans. He believed the internet was the future of gaming. No one else in the industry thought online gaming for consoles would work, but Okawa. He put his money where his mouth was. Sega didn't just release a console with a built-in modem. Akawa paid for free internet access bundled with the Dreamcast in Japan. That's right, he fronted the bill so players could jump into this online revolution without worrying about those ridiculous pay-per-minute dial-up fees. Before we continue, let's rewind for a second and talk about the crew behind this masterpiece. Sonic Team, fresh off their success with Sonic Adventure, suddenly had a new mission. Create Sega's flagship online game. Initially, they weren't too excited about it. They were busy making cool stuff like Choo Choo Rocket, which was also an online game, but nowhere near the scale of what PSO was aiming for. But you know what they say, pressure makes diamonds, and oh boy did Sonic Team deliver. This wasn't going to be some copy-paste online RPG from the West. No, Naka and his team wanted something new, something innovative. Sure, they took inspiration from big names like Diablo, Ultima Online, and EverQuest, but this wasn't just about recreating what already existed. Sonic Team had to figure out how to blend the Fancy Star universe with fast real-time combat and smooth online connectivity, all on a console that had about as much RAM as your smartphone's calculator app. And here's the wild part. The Dreamcast wasn't exactly a powerhouse. It had a 56k modem, which meant, yep, dial-up internet. And we can all remember the glorious sound. But Sonic Team didn't just make it work. They absolutely nailed it. PSO's real-time combat and seamless multiplayer made you feel like you were playing in an arcade, except the other three players could be in Japan, in Europe, in North America, or just, you know, across the street from where you're living. But for those who never got to experience this, let's talk about the actual game. PSO wasn't just a tech demo, it was a full-blown action RPG that gave players the freedom to build their own adventure. You could choose from a handful of races, humans, humans, which were the sci-fi equivalent of elves, and androids, the walking, talking, badasses with lasers. And then of course you had the classes, whether you're a tech-savvy force wielding all kinds of powerful techniques, which are basically spells, or a hunter up close and personal with melee combat, or finally the ranger picking off enemies from a distance. The choice was ultimately yours. Once you created your character, you weren't just thrown into a random world. First you arrived at Pioneer 2, the hub world. This was a space station where you could buy and sell gear, heal up, and most importantly, chat. Now, remember, this is early 2000s. Voice chat wasn't a thing on consoles yet. Instead, you used a keyboard, either a physical one, or if you had a death wish, the on-screen keyboard. Typing out, help, I'm about to die in the middle of a boss fight, well, good luck. But here's where it gets interesting. Sonic Team built an entire word select system that could automatically translate languages. So whether you were in Japan, France, in the US, wherever, players could actually communicate. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. That's the kind of innovation that made PSO so special. And interestingly, Final Fantasy XI pulled a similar tactic with their auto-translate system. The world of PSO was broken into four main environments. You had the lush forest, the claustrophobic caves, the industrial mines, and the haunting ruins. Each area was packed with enemies, puzzles, and ultimately, a boss. Now, this is where Fancy Star Online truly really shined. Combat was real-time, meaning you had to be on your toes, chain attacks, dodge hits, and work with your team to take down massive bosses like the Dragon, Fallout, or for the uninitiated, Dark Falls. Ah, Dark Falls. Let's talk about this eldritch nightmare. 
Wolf wasn't just your run-of-the-mill final boss. It's the kind of enemy that haunts you, part alien, part ancient evil, and 100% ready to destroy your entire party if you weren't careful. The battle was tough, unforgiving, but incredibly rewarding. And if you beat it, you felt like you had earned that victory. And while you were out slashing and casting techniques, you also had your trusty companion, the mag. Think of mags like your little floating pets that helped you out in battle. But here's the thing, they were only as good as you treated them. You had to feed your mag items to level up. It was essentially a futuristic Tamagotchi, but instead of crying, it gave you stat boosts and the occasional screen clearing special attack. Honestly, the mags were like your best friend in the game. Forget Pokemon, I was more worried about making sure my mag was happy than anything else. The launch of Fancy Star Online was a huge deal. PSO was hyped as a game changer, the next big step in the evolution of RPGs. And when it dropped, it didn't disappoint. It sold half a million copies in Japan alone, and over a million worldwide. Not bad for an online experiment on a console that many people had already written off. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Like most online games, PSO had its fair share of problems. First up, cheaters. People figured out how to duplicate items, max out stats, and even crash other players' games. It got so bad that Sonic Team had to issue warnings and start banning people, something that was essentially unheard of in console gaming at the time. But Sega didn't just stop there. Less than a year later, they released Fancy Star Online version 2. This wasn't just a minor update. It had an increased level cap, a whole new ultimate mode for high-level players, a PvP battle mode, and even a bizarre, fun football, or soccer, depending where you're from, minigame with Choo Choo Rocket style football balls. And finally, there was the challenge mode, where you had limited gear and had to complete missions without dying. By 2001, Sega had left the hardware business, but PSO wasn't going anywhere. It jumped straight into the GameCube and Xbox as Fancy Star Online Episode 1 and 2. The GameCube version even added split-screen multiplayer letting you team up with friends on the couch, which was pretty rare for online RPGs at the time. Of course, we can't talk about the GameCube release without bringing up the keyboard controller. Yep, that was a thing. Imagine a GameCube controller fused with a full keyboard. It was like holding a laptop in your hands. As ridiculous as it looked, it was actually pretty useful for typing messages during gameplay. I didn't have one myself, but I did have a GameCube keyboard. Episode 3 Card Revolution is where things got… weird. Instead of the more action-packed RPG goodness, Sonic Team decided to turn the gameplay into a turn-based card game. Yep, you heard that right, a card game. While it wasn't a complete disaster, fans of the original PSO were a bit baffled. But hey, Sega were experimenting, and you've got to give them credit for trying something new. Personally, I really enjoyed it, but I know that a lot of people did not enjoy it. Fast forward to today, and while the official servers for Fancy Star Online may have shut down years ago, the game still lives on. Thanks to dedicated fans, private servers have kept the magic of Ragol alive. You can still log on, join a party, and grind for those rare items just like it was in 2001 all over again. But of course, the legacy of PSO doesn't stop with just private servers. It paved the way for Fancy Star Universe in 2006, which actually I thought was really fun. And of course, the massive hit Fantasy Star Online 2 in 2012, which is still ongoing. Even games like Monster Hunter and other multiplayer dungeon crawlers owe a huge debt to PSO's cooperative gameplay formula. At the end of the day, Fantasy Star Online wasn't just a game, it was a revolution. It showed the world that console gamers didn't have to be left behind. We could team up, battle bosses, and create memories together, all from the comfort of our living rooms. So next time you're in an MMO raid or a co-op dungeon crawl, remember where it all started. And maybe, just maybe, you'll hear that dial-up modem connecting in the back of your mind. Thanks for watching, adventurers. If you enjoyed this trip down memory lane, don't forget to like, subscribe, and as always, feed your mag. See you next time on Pioneer 2.